We are on Jeremiah 33. <clears throat> Verse 1. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the second time, while he was still confined in the court of the guard, saying... Now, Jeremiah is still confined to prison here, but now he's in the court of the prison. He, he, uh, the elders and the officers of the king can more easily consult with Jeremiah being in the court instead of the cell that he was in previously. And this chapter is going to give us insight into the coming kingdom. <clears throat> we were told in the two previous chapters how Elohim would have mercy on Judah and Jerusalem and form a new covenant with them. He said he'd give them a new heart and they would follow his Torah. In uh, just the last chapter, Jeremiah 32, starting at verse 38. And they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. And I'll give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. I'll put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And I'll rejoice over them to do them good, and I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Now in this chapter, he's going to give us a little insight into this kingdom that's coming. Even in the future. For us. For us. Yes. <clears throat> Verses 2 and 3. Thus says Yahweh who made the earth and Yahweh who formed it to, established it to establish it, Yahweh is his name. Call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now the word mighty there, it's the Hebrew word bazar. And uh, it's, uh, it's a word here, there's, the, uh, there's what the concordance says about it. It talks about, a, it's, a, it's a term of fortification. Is what it is. Elohim is going to reveal things to Jeremiah that are fortified. They have an impenetrable wall about them. They can't be pierced. Elohim is going to, going to unveil some of these things here to Jeremiah. Verses 4 and 5. For thus says Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, concerning the houses of the city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are broken down to make a defense against the siege mounds, and against the sword. While they are coming to fight with the Chaldeans and to fill them with the corpses of men whom I've slain in my anger and in my wrath, and I've hidden my face from this city because of all their wickedness. Well, Elohim is going to reveal certain things concerning the city of Jerusalem and concerning the kings of Judah. Notice uh, he doesn't mention the kings of Israel here. Uh, they're already, they're gone. Elohim says the corpses of Judah will fill the walls of the city when they start to fight the Babylonians. <clears throat> the Judah, corpses of Judah, of the, that were there, Jeremiah's talking to. Verse 6, Behold, I'll bring it to health and healing. And I will heal them, and I'll reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. And I'll restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel. <clears throat> and I'll rebuild them as they were at first. And I'll cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I'll pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me, and by which they have transgressed against me. Now Elohim is going to bring them health, healing, and restoration is what he says. He's going to cleanse them from iniquity, sin, and trespasses. Now that Hebrew term for iniquity, it's a vown. It's, it's a reference to guilt. The Hebrew term uh, for sin is kata, and it means miss the mark. And the Hebrew term for transgression is pasha. It's a reference to offenses committed. So Elohim is going to cleanse them of all their guilt, of all their instances of missing the mark when it comes to following his Torah, and of all their offenses committed. So he's covering it. Cleansing, in many cases, can only take place through the blood of the sacrifice. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, 
For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. And this cleansing can only occur through the blood of Messiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah 33, verse 9. And it shall be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear of all the good that I do for them. And they shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the peace that I make for it. Now, why will all the nations of the earth fear and tremble when Elohim does this? When does all these good, th good things for Israel, why will everybody else fear and tremble? Well, it's going to be at that time that Jerusalem and Israel will be on the verge of total annihilation by their enemies. It'll be at that time Elohim will, risk, will rescue Israel by his own hand. In Zechariah 14, starting at verse 1, Behold, a day is coming for Yahweh when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Uh, now, he talks about all the nations. Let's don't get caught up. Well, you know, what about Luxembourg? Okay, no, he's, he's talking about the nations that surround Israel. Now, if you have a difficult time envisioning how the nations surrounding Israel might attack them, uh, you shouldn't, because it's, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, we look just, yeah, look at the map. It, the clock is ticking on that. <clears throat> he says, I'll gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be captured. The house is plundered. The women ravished and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. <clears throat> and in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. So it's interesting. So Elohim has feet? This is a reference to Messiah, who's a manifestation of the Father. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. So that half the mountain will move toward the north, the other half toward the south. And you'll flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you'll flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my Elohim, will come and all the holy ones with him. How will all the holy ones be with him? That's the resurrection. That's correct. That's, this is where uh, he's, gonna, he's going to come down. It says all the, in, in Zechariah 12, all the tribes of the earth will look upon him whom they pierced as he comes down and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, <clears throat> you know how Paul says that uh, the uh, dead and Messiah will rise first and then we who are still alive will meet him in the air? That means he, that's because he's coming down. Okay? That's because he's coming down. That's when the resurrection takes place. Dead and Messiah will rise first. Yeah, uh-huh. No, they're not already up there. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thought that you die and a ghost goes up into the clouds to be with Grandma and Grandpa, that all comes from one parable, which is the rich man and Lazarus, and the misplaced comma <clears throat> in translation. Well, it's at that time Elohim will bring healing or, and health and restoration, and the blessings for Israel will be innumerable. He told Daniel at the very end of his, uh, his writing, and from the, it's Daniel 12, starting at verse 11, and from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. What does he mean by allotted portion? Part of the kingdom. That's correct. That is correct. Going back to Jeremiah 33, verse 10. Thus says Yahweh, yet again there shall be heard in this place of which you say it is a waste, without man and without beast, that is, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast. 
the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Yahweh of hosts, for Yahweh is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And of those who bring a thank offering into the house of Yahweh, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were at first, says Yahweh. The voices heard will be joy, gladness, and thanks. Notice, it says there's going to be thanksgiving offerings there too. <clears throat> They'll be in the house of Yahweh. Verses 12 and 13, thus says the Yahweh of hosts, there shall again be in this place which is waste without man or beast, and in all its cities a habitation of shepherds who rest their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the low, low land, in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, the flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who numbers them, says Yahweh. The land will be used for shepherding again. Uh, it won't be used for missile defense systems anymore. Right now it is. It has to be. But in that day, missiles and bombs won't be necessary. Verses 14 and 15, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute just, justice and righteousness on the earth. <clears throat> so that righteous branch of David, it says branch of David, it's talking about a descendant of David is going to spring forth and execute justice and righteousness on the earth. That's the Messiah. And even the, uh, the ancient rabbis knew that this is speaking of the Messiah. You know, what is the term Mashiach? That's the Hebrew word. What does that mean? Anointed one. It means anointed one. But if you, if they will tell you, well, there's been a lot of anointed ones. I mean, Aaron was an anointed one. Uh, David was an anointed one. Uh, the, term, the term Mashiach is not exclusive. Okay, and and they they want to push that, you know, the the coming Messiah will be another anointed one. But the problem is when they the ancient rabbis before they had an axe to grind, they looked at this and said, well, there's Mashiachs, but then there's the Mashiach. Okay, the Messiah is what being spoken of here. <clears throat> and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. <clears throat> Now, in Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13, we read, Then say to him, Thus says the Yahweh of hosts, hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he'll build the temple of Yahweh. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he'll be priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Uh, there's a lot there in a couple of verses. First of all, the, what temple is he talking about? That's that one in Ezekiel, chapter, chapter 40 through 48. There's a, there's a different temple they describe there. It's, it's similar to the one from Solomon, but it's, it's bigger and it's different. And <clears throat> it says here, he's going to build that. And it says he's going to sit on the throne, too. And he's going to be the high priest. Okay, now, normally that wouldn't be possible because to be priest, you have to be from the tribe of Levi. And he's from the tribe of Judah. Okay, so he could be, uh, he's, he's from the kingly line, but they say he's going to be priest too. So something's got to change. All right, we'll get to that. Let's look at Isaiah 2, starting at verse 2. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And they'll judge between the nations and render many decisions for many peoples. And they'll hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. 
Going back to Jeremiah 33, verse 16, In those days Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she shall be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. So when this happens, all Judah and Jerusalem are going to dwell in safety, and Jerusalem is going to be called us. Yahweh is our righteousness. Verses 17 and 18. For thus says Yahweh, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. Hmm. Well, how sure are you that David will never lack a man to sit on the throne when Messiah returns? How sure are you of that? Positive, without a doubt. Well, you can be just as assured that the priests will never like a man to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices, too. Same way. A lot of people, hmm? The reason you're sure of it is because Elohim said so. He said so. Yep. And he puts the two, just as, just as Messiah is going to reign on the throne forever, there's always going to be the Levitical priest to do offerings. <clears throat> um, that's always going to be the case. You know, we, we tend to think a lot of people have the mindset, oh, no, no. There's not going to be sacrifices done again. Uh, I've been told that's a slap in the face of Jesus. You ever heard that? Yeah. I have. Yeah, I knew, yeah. I knew Pauline had. Uh, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. That's not what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. This is a this is a this is a, a order of fellowship with the Father that we're not privy to at this time. That's what it is. Um, goodness gracious. And people think, well, sacrifices, they're horrible. Horrible. Look at the cheeseburger in front of you when you say how horrible it is. You're shielded from the reality, I guess, but you're enjoying that, that slaughter, okay? And the difference is that they're going to be done, the slaughter's going to be done at the place Elohim dictates and in the manner he dictates. And in many cases, they will, those will be barbecues for the people. In other cases, there won't be. There'll be burnt, there's burnt offerings and others that are not a party time. But a lot like you just talked about Thanksgiving offerings. Those are ones that are shared with the people. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, going back to this Levitical priest thing. You know, there's going to be Levitical priests, but there will be a high priest according to a different order, the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek. This priest, he's not a Levite. This priest will be our high priest who will also be the prince, the son of David. In Ezekiel 45, if you want to read about this, this future temple that's going to be built, start reading Ezekiel 40 through 48. Okay? And Ezekiel lays, lays this whole thing out chronologically. In Ezekiel 37, it was, uh, that's about the Valley of the Dry Bones. Do you remember that? Okay, what's, uh, what happens in that? That's a regathering of Israel into the land. Yeah. Ezekiel 36, the chapter before that, it talks about the New Covenant. Changing the hearts and minds, bringing the people back to him. And then 37 is the regathering. And then 38 and 39, it's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. We just read about that in Zechariah. That's going to be the, when the Islamic nations attack Jerusalem and Israel and try to destroy them. And they're going to be destroyed is what's going to happen. Uh, in those chapters, it says there's going to be seven months trying to bury all the dead bodies. And with the equipment we have today, that's going to be a lot of dead bodies. But then after that, he talks about this new temple that's going to be coming. It's going to be built. And how there's going to be offerings done there. And in chapter 45, starting in verse 16, all the people of the land shall give to this offering for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to provide the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the libations at the feasts on the new moons and on the Sabbaths. At all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel, he shall provide the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Yeshua will provide these offerings as a reminder of the sacrifice that he made to cleanse us of our sins. 
lest we forget. Going back to Jeremiah 33, verse 19. And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says Yahweh, if you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that my day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levitical priests, my ministers. Elohim saying that if you can change day and night, if that could be changed, if that could be broken, then his covenant with the son of David and with the Le Levitical priests can be, can be broken. He's saying you can't, that's not going to, that's not going to be broken. That is impossible. His covenant with the day and nights are reference to the fact that the sun, moon, and stars will never cease to shine. In Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36, Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for the light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. <clears throat> so just as sure as we have the sun, moon, and stars up in the sky, the offspring of Israel will never cease to be a nation before him forever when they're reestablished. Those Levitical priests that he's speaking of here. See, I find it interesting. I don't, um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard to say who's a Levite and who isn't. I've heard people claim to be a Levite, and they say I've been... Uh, I've had my uh, uh, genetic code tested. I don't know what you compare it to to say you're a Levite. Uh, makes no sense to me, but I think some people speak of a lot of things that, uh, that they don't know much about. But it's possible he's speaking of all of Israel being his priests and kings. In uh, Revelation 1, verse 6, it says, And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his Elohim and father. To him be the glory and domination forever and ever. Amen. In Exodus 20, or 19, he says he wants Israel to all be priests. Okay? That may, that may be the case when we're fully redeemed. <clears throat> when the covenant is fully, is made full in us. Could be Levitical. Could be. Don't know. Revelation 5 verse 10 said, And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our Elohim, and they'll reign upon the earth. So, uh, you know, he says there's going to be Levites. I don't know who will be and who won't be. He doesn't really designate. Right, right. Yeah, right. V very good. They're very, very well may be. Going back to Jeremiah 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be counted, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. So the number of the, the descendants of uh, David and the Levites appear to be the same number. Uh, this is a reiteration of the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verses 23 and 24, And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not observed what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which Yahweh chose, he's rejected them. Thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. <clears throat> the world thinks Elohim has rejected Israel and Judah. The world thinks that. Most Bible teachers and others erroneously only refer to the Jews as Israel. But Elohim's referring to those he regards as his people, which is Israel and Judah. Verses 25 and 26, thus says Yahweh, If my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers, over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. 
Elohim will restore the fortunes of Israel and will have mercy on them. And this restoration includes that priestly ministry. You know, there's an awful lot in Scripture that talks about that, like the Levitical priests and the Levites. And, you know, there's one book in the Torah that never mentions the Levites. It's Leviticus. It never mentions them. I just thought that was interesting. But they're spoken of a lot. <clears throat> We're all going to what? Yeah. Yeah, we'll all be kings and priests, it says. Well, how about right there? How about there? Unaccessible, yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I claim that it's fortified. Let's look at chapter 30, uh, 34. A little bit different here. Jeremiah, I told you, Jeremiah will jump around on you. Okay? He'll be talking about the kingdom that's coming, and now he's going to look, uh, he's gonna look the, the current king in the eye and tell him how the hog's going to eat the cabbage. Okay? Verse 1 of Jeremiah 34, the word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army with all the kingdoms of the earth that were under his domain and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and against all its cities, saying, well, the time of the message to Jeremiah here is about 589 B.C. Jeremiah is going to prophesy of the destruction of the city and Zedekiah's captivity and death. The armies of the world were fighting against Jerusalem and the other cities in Judah. And it's not going to go well for them. Verse 2, Thus says Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I'm giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he'll burn it with fire. Jeremiah is telling Zedekiah what is going to happen to the city. Now Zedekiah was evil in the sight of Elohim because he did not humble himself before the words of his prophet. We read about that in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 11 and 12. So you can go to, you can go to Chronicles and Kings and Samuel and get chronology of stuff that happened historically. Okay, when you read about what these prophets did and so forth, oftentimes you can go back to 1st, 2nd Samuel, which by the way, we, we made 1st and 2nd. Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, it's all just... It was just all Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. But you can get some historical, uh, you can get some more historical information and, and also chronology by going back there. It says Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of Yahweh his Elohim. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for Yahweh. <clears throat> uh, you know, what about what about people today who don't humble themselves before the words of his prophets that are in his word? I don't think it's going to be any different. I don't think everyone's going to have the same judgment as this, but there's going to be judgment. Jeremiah 34, starting at verse 3, You will not escape from his hand, for you will surely be captured and delivered into his hand. And you'll see the king of Babylon eye to eye, and he'll speak with you face to face. And you will go to Babylon... Yet hear the word of Yahweh, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says Yahweh concerning you, you will not die by the sword. You will die in peace. And as spices are burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so they will burn spices for you and they will lament for you. Alas, master, for I have spoken the word, declares Yahweh. Zedekiah is not going to die in battle. He'll be delivered right to Nebuchadnezzar. The people of Judah are going to lament for Zedekiah, uh, but he, he will die in peace. That doesn't mean happy. Verses 6 and 7. 
Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem, when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the remaining cities of Judah, that is, Lachish and Ezekah. For they alone remained as fortified cities among the cities of Judah. So we have three cities that remained. Jerusalem, Lachish, and Ezekah. <clears throat> they, these three were, were close together. Uh, there's Ezekah, there's Lachish, and there's Jerusalem. See, they were just all right here. And naturally, Babylon came from the north, so these people are the last to go. <clears throat> Now, Jeremiah is going to tell Zedekiah, tell us that Zedekiah told the people that they were to free the Hebrew slaves. Zedekiah was supposed, he, the people were supposed to do that. Zedekiah told them to, but the people were treacherous in their dealings. Elohim expects us to keep our word, especially when it's, a, when it's an order. Verses 8 and 9 of Jeremiah 34, the word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh after King Zedekiah made a covenant with all the people who were in Jerusalem to proclaim release to them, that each man should uh, set free his male servant and each man his female servant, a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman, so that no one should keep them, a Jew his brother, in bondage. The people made a covenant with Zedekiah that they would release their Hebrew slaves. And covenants were made, how were covenants made back then? If you want to do an official covenant, you recall, Abraham made one with Elohim. You'll take a, a, a sacrificial animal, split it in half, okay? And you'll walk between the, the pieces of the, of the animal. <clears throat> the people apparently did this with Zedekiah. If a Hebrew was sold as a slave, he was to be released after, after six years regardless of his debt. Deuteronomy 15, starting at verse 12. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. And when you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh your Elohim redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. So they're supposed to release all Hebrew slaves after six years, always. Verses 10 and 11, Jeremiah 34. And all the officials and all the people obeyed, who had entered into the covenant that each man should set free his male servant and each man his female servant, so that no one should keep them any longer in bondage. They obeyed and set them free. But, well, it's, it's usually not a good word. But. Afterward, they turned around and took back the male servants and the female servants whom they set free and brought them into sub subjection for male servants and for female servants. Well, all you said to do was set them free. You didn't say we couldn't subject them back again, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's what they did. Let them go and they got in the chariots, chased them back down, brought them back. Yeah, that one time. You know, the people obeyed there at first, and they retracted their righteous actions by forcing these people to return. Verse 12, Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, Thus says Yahweh Elohim of Israel, I made a covenant with your forefathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you shall set free his Hebrew br brother, who has been sold to you and has served you six years, you shall send him out free from you. But your forefathers did not obey me or incline their ear to me. So that was always the case. At the end of the sixth year, the people are to set the, the Hebrew slaves free. You know this pattern. If you'll notice, it's a six and then seven pattern. It's like the week. Six days of work, and then the seventh day, you're free. It's... Uh, it's, it's, it's a common pattern in Scripture. In Exodus 23, starting at verse 10. And you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. 
But on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you are to do your work. But on the seventh day you shall cease from labor in order that your ox and your donkey may rest. And the son of your female slave as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. See, that pattern is a pattern that they kept breaking. Okay, now why would they bring back the slaves? Why would we do that? Other than the obvious reason they're being wrong. What purpose did they do that for? What was that? Money. Money. Greed. Okay. Why are they going into Babylon for punishment for 70 years exactly? They didn't let the land rest for how long? Yeah, <laughs> calculator blew a fuse for 490 years. They went 490 years without doing this land Sabbath thing. Why? Greed. It's money. Money. That's more important than obedience to the Father is money. Why do you think Elohim says you can't serve Elohim and mammon? Why do people, why do people work on a Sabbath day? Money. Money. You break this cycle of freedom for the people in the land for the sake of money. Greed. That's evil. That is where you can tell. You choose man's way, the way of mammon, over the ways of the Father. Okay? That's how you can tell. You know, people, people think of things like, uh, well, you watch too much football, that's your God. No, I just like football. I serve Elohim. I don't serve football. It's only four months away, by the way. <laughs> but how do you know that's your God? No, it's not. My Elohim is who I serve and who, why I rest on that seventh day. That's the sign between me and him. <clears throat> People, you, this, is, this is the difference, okay? This is the difference between his ways and the way of the world is right here. Yeah, money. It's money, your God. Verses 15 and 16 of Jeremiah 34. Although recently you had turned and done what is right in my sight, each man proclaiming release to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Ooh. Yet you turned and profaned my name. Each man took back his male servant, and each man his female servant, whom you had set free according to their desire. And you brought them into subjection to be your male servants and female servants. Elohim told Israel they were to release those Hebrew slaves after six years as a reminder, as a reminder that you were once slaves in Egypt. The people disregarded that command. Elohim says that's profaning his name. They're, they're, they were enslaving his people. His people were enslaving his people. Okay? Yeah. I thought after they 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 so and so did the slavery to pay off a debt they owed her some and so at so were they trying to keep them even after they paid their debt off? Yeah. Yeah, they were just keeping them. And even at that, it doesn't matter if if it, if the if the debt they had was twenty million dollars, at the end of six years they're free. Right. right. Verse 17 of Jeremiah 34, Therefore thus says Yahweh, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming release each man to his brother and each man his neighbor. Behold, I'm proclaiming a release to you, declares Yahweh. I'm releasing you to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine, and I'll make you a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Since they won't proclaim release to the Hebrew slaves, Elohim is going to release them from his protection. They'll now become slaves to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. Verse 18, And I'll give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and pass between its parts. Remember we talked about that. That's a covenant they made. It was very official. 
the officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf. And I'll give them into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their life. And the dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. The covenant with Zedekiah was one. They made it before Elohim. And they broke it. Elohim takes his covenants very, very, very seriously. Okay? That goes for marriage. That goes for a covenant that's made. It's very important. That's... uh, that's why Yeshua made it a big deal. He said, first of all, don't make a vow if you're not serious about it. Okay, that's a covenant between you and the Father. And he said, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Um, don't, don't be screaming. That, have you seen these guys that would swear on a stack of Bibles this tall? How do you know they're lying? Because they said they'd swear on a stack of Bibles that tall. That's pretty much the reason. But his covenants, are he takes them very seriously. No, the people are going to die for this. Verses 21 and 22, And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life, and into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which has gone away from you. Behold, I'm going to com- uh, command, declares Yahweh, and I'll bring them back to this city, and they shall fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire. And I'll make the cities of Judah a, de- a desolation without in- inhabitants. Zedekiah will be delivered into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. The city is going to be destroyed. Excuse me, no inhabitants. And that's exactly what happened. Look at 2 Kings 29, starting at verse 1. It came about in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, camped against it and built a siege wall all around it. So that the city was under siege, until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. What, what's a siege wall again? What would that do? Be ramps to get over the walls. Yeah, yeah the, first, the first object of it is to cut it off so you, no food and water can go in. They wouldn't last 11 years. No, they didn't. <laughs> See, it started on the ninth year of his reign, if you look at verse 1, and then on the 11th year. is. So we're talking... Uh, Less than two years. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went by way of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and he passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then they put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of Yahweh, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, Even every great house he burned with fire. So, any uh, any thoughts? Any questions on Jeremiah thirty-three and thirty-four? No, that, no, that's just the seventh year. Now, the year Jubilee, that's every 50th year. Yeah, that's every 50th year. What happens then, if you sold your land, you get it back then. Okay, that's what Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to you. Yep. That's right. Everything, you see, Elohim's Torah is about redemption. It really is. It's all about redemption. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
and, and they have that now. But they're going to go in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Then they're going to leave Babylon. They're going to have names for the months. That's, that's Babylonian paganism they adopted. Uh-huh. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there's a term you could u- probably use called the last straw. Well, okay, I got you. But uh, I mean, it makes you wonder if four servants, they probably got slaughtered right along with... Sure, they did. Yeah. They did. It was everybody. Uh, the, the, the problems, there were many, many, many problems. Okay, there was adultery, there was idolatry, there was cheating the neighbor, there was uh, uh, not taking care of the widow and the, the fatherless. There, all the problems were there. They, they weren't doing anything, according to the Torah, except coming and doing their, their offerings. Come and do my offerings. You know, that's like, uh, uh, you know, some Christians do whatever during the week, but still they go to church on Sunday. There, got my time in. Well, that's what they did with the offerings. They said, there, did my part. Elohim said, no, you didn't. Yeah, through the drive through lane. You're right. Yep. The three-legged, one-eyed goat. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get rid of him anyway. So let the, let the priest get rid of him. Um, but that's why he said he wants obedience rather than sacrifice. If all you're going to do is give sacrifice, he doesn't want them. Okay? Not interested at all. He wants obedience. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for your word through your prophet Jeremiah and the other prophets too and how they, uh, they, they coincide with one another. They tell us the complete story and we praise your name for that. We, uh, we pray that you draw us closer to you to continue to write your Torah on our hearts and minds as we pray as your humble servants. Amen.